welcome. As we find our spots, we're going to gather together to worship the Lord. We always have the reminder in our church that our altars are always available for um, any time in our worship time. It's never a distraction if you want to pray. And um, we're going to start with a song about just giving thanks to the Lord. We've come off of Thanksgiving. We're heading into the Advent season currently. But our hearts are continually full with thanks to the Lord. And I was thinking how many of the Psalms, so written for us thousands of years ago, would say, give thanks to the Lord. He is good. So please stand with us as we worship.
shall come with trumpet sound. to be um, heading into Advent. Some of us have probably, I haven't, but some of you have probably already started decorating for Christmas. And I've had some people through the years asking, well, what is Advent? And what does that even mean? And I know Sean's going to be speaking on that today, kind of leading us in. But I wanted to read to you um, something that I read that was just from the Bible Project. I always, I highly recommend that website. They have a lot of tools for understanding the Bible, and they gave this definition of Advent. Advent is when we remember and celebrate the coming of Jesus on earth. We believe Jesus is the incarnation of God and the long-awaited Messiah that was foretold in the, in the word in the scriptures. Also, we reflect on the unexpected nature of his humble birth and join in an anticipation with past and present believers of when he will come again to reunite heaven and earth once and for all. So that's what we're going to be thinking about in the days to come. And um, one of the songs, well, we're going to sing a song called You Deserve the Glory and also Emmanuel, which we've already said means God with us. So we're just going to keep praising the Lord for who he is.
Please be seated. Uh, children, you're released to Children's Church and ushers, if you would come forward, please. Let's take some moments here to uh, continue in worship. Worship is not simply singing songs. It's not simply the giving of tithes and offerings. It is whole life worship. And as we start a new week, I want to encourage you to be ready to make the offering day by day of yourself to the Lord, right? That's, that's what we're beginning today in our gathering. Lord, as we take these moments to give back to you, we thank you for how you've provided for us. You've given us life and you've given us the provisions for life. You've given us shelter, relationships, purpose. Lord, of all of these things, once we've given ourselves to you, you become the owner. We belong to you. And so, Lord, we give to you from what you've given to us to steward for you. It's our hope and prayer that you would receive that as, this as worship and you are worthy of that. We bless your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you as you worship. Thank you, Lacey. I greet you today in the strong name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In a world that is full of chaos, we <clears throat> need a Prince of Peace, and he is called the Prince of Peace. Amen. So I greet you in his name. I greet those of you that are with us online. The Lord bless you and be with you as well. Speaking of peace, I was uh, at the final Civil War game with some people here, and there was a lack of it, and I'm concerned about the church um, because it says in the scripture that it's good for brothers and sisters to dwell in unity. <clears throat> we have some work to do. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's just a bunch of duck fans saying amen. Um, no, it was really, it was really good. Good to be together. Really good to be together. We, um, in one of the songs that we sang, there was this lyric. I just, I have to take a moment and talk about it. Did you catch where it talks about a trumpet sound? And in Christ I will be found. You ever, the scriptures speak to the return of Jesus in his glorified sense. Not, not like his ascension when he had died and resurrected and was ascended to heaven. But the scriptures talk about the Lord coming back. And there are some scriptures that describe that coming back, that second coming accompanied by the sound of a trumpet, among other things. A trumpet, not a clarinet, not a trombone, but a, a trumpet. I was talking with someone earlier this morning about one of the <clears throat> marks of the early church, the very first followers of Jesus, was a peaked sense, like a heightened sense of anticipation for the Lord returning. 
That was very common. In fact, in the early churches, you read the apostles in their writing. They talk about Jesus coming back, that second coming with, at the trumpet sound, as if it was going to happen next week. They were just that ready and looking for it. And some have said, <clears throat> you know, it's been about 2,000 years. So did they get it wrong? And I, I would say, no, I don't think that they did. I think even in these days, the mark of those that are growing deep-rooted in Christ, in their faith in Christ, are anticipating his return. I remember when I was younger in, in the Lord, <clears throat> I didn't want him to return right away. I mean, I wanted him to return. I just didn't want him to return right away because there were some boxes I needed to check, some life I needed to live, some games I needed to win, right? Now, looking back, if he'd have come back then, I, I would have lost a lot fewer games. But I, I had this sense like, I, not, not yet, Lord. But it, it's not 100%, but as we grow in our faith in Christ, you look around and see if you can see this in one another and in others. The anticipation of the Lord's return becomes higher and higher. And I find myself wondering, what's that trumpet going to sound like when the Lord comes back? Listen for the trumpet. Listen for the trumpet. Well, I, Diane, thank you for saying what you did about Advent and the anticipation of the Lord's coming. At the creation, <clears throat> the Lord created the heavens and the earth and He created Adam and Eve. And He placed them in this place that we know as the garden or the Garden of Eden. And as the Lord described it to them, He talked about the blessing that would be for them in this garden. But there was one tree that produced a fruit that they were not to eat from. And, and the first time that death is talked about in the Bible is the Lord talking to Adam especially to say, this, the fruit that this tree produces is toxic, even toxic unto death. And there's no indication that Adam would have had a full understanding of what that meant. But there was a creature in the garden. There's not a lot of explanation or background given to this creature, simply known as the snake. Uh, it's a snake that talks. That's a little odd as well. But we know this, that this snake was contrary to God and said things that were just the opposite of what God was saying. In fact, the first things out of this snake's mouth to Adam and Eve were this. Did God really say, or if you're into the King James Hath God really said? Questioning God. Did, did God really say that you would die if you ate that, that fruit? Because that fruit isn't toxic. Uh, and there is the addition to the questioning of God's character. Because if you eat the fruit, this is what the snake said, this is Sean's paraphrase, you'll become like God. You won't die. Surely you won't die. You'll become like him. Well, if you know the story, they both ate the toxic fruit. And death entered in to what we know as the creation. And... This snake, this evil, finds itself an expression of itself 
not only throughout the pages of Scripture, but we see it and the evidence of it in our world, don't we? This contrary and toxic word and presence that's opposed to God. It's, it's what's behind battles. It's what gives fuel and flame to arrogance and pride and hatred. But what happened once Adam and Eve tasted of that toxic fruit, they certainly started, what happened was the start of a cycle of death that we are all too familiar with, aren't we? We're all too familiar with that. But the Lord said, and he, he engaged Adam and Eve right after they had bought the lie. And one of the things that the Lord, that, that God said was, I'm going to take you out of this garden. As good as it is, it's, it's not going to be safe for you to stay here as well because you might eat from the tree of life and so he shut them off from that because they were in need of a remedy (laughs) and that is the story of the scriptures the remedy and the lengths to which God will go to bring a remedy to the effects of something that is toxic in our life. How's that? Have you ever thought about the Scripture and the Bible being a story of a loving, redemptive remedy for a death sentence? And he said, the Lord said to to Adam and Eve about this remedy, there will come one who will crush the head of the serpent that has that has started the lie the one who has planted the seed of death there will come one who is an offspring of Eve who will crush the head of that serpent but in that process that serpent will strike the heel of that one who is to come and the followers of God in all of their tribes and denominations have looked to someone coming. And you know who is the common denominator for that? Jesus Christ. So as we are looking through this advent and and considering this remedy that God is bringing, we're going to find that the remedy is Christ and the fulfillment of the promises, the fulfillment of the prophecies, they find all of their fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. So I want to look at a story today that there's the effects of toxicity in this story. And there's an attempt by God to bring some comfort and care and remedy to the just that situation. And we're going to see how this person responds to the offer of help and comfort and remedy. But before I do that, I, I, I've been thinking about this. I, I heard this, uh, the definitions. The definition of grace is that we get something that we do not deserve. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense, right? We get something that we do not deserve. Mercy is that we don't get something that we do deserve, right? Like I, I've deserved some things that I haven't gotten, like punishments. But I've, I, I grew up in a merciful home most of the time. I mean, I had three older brothers, so. But have you received something you didn't deserve? 
That would be grace. Or have you not received something that you did deserve? That, that could be mercy. And who deserves grace? Who, who, who deserves, I mean, other than us, right? Who, who deserves grace? Something that, that we really haven't earned or deserved. Who, who deserves the grace of God? Who deserves the mercy of God? The covering over of things that by right should bring punishment. Who deserves the presence of God, the comfort, or the care? There might be some people that come to your mind that are in the category of, well, of anybody that deserves it, these people and this person definitely don't. And I'll bet you that person is glad that you're not on God's selection committee for who deserves his presence and his comfort and his care. However, I don't mean to ruin your day, you might be on somebody's list, the naughty list. You might be considered by some as someone who doesn't deserve God's presence, care, or comfort, his mercy or grace. And here's the thing. Sometimes we put ourselves on that list. Have you ever done that? Where you've just made the decision, I'm not worthy. I don't deserve God's grace. I don't deserve his presence or his comfort or his care. Either one is troublesome. When we banish ourselves or someone else from the presence and comfort and care of the Lord. Now the story that we're going to look at, I will just tell you up front, at the end, you may come to the conclusion, I don't think like God. Uh, He thinks differently than me. So, before we read, let's pray and ask God to help us understand what we're going to read. We know that you can do this, Lord. Holy Spirit, we know that you can speak to us in a way that we understand. And so in your kindness and in your grace and mercy, would you help us to understand what we're going to read? And would you help us to take up courage to act on it? We're listening for your voice, Holy Spirit. And we pray a prayer of thanksgiving to you, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. We know that you are the one true God. Amen. Okay, so the story is in Isaiah 7. It's about a young king. This king is named Ahaz. Ahaz is the king of Judah. And this uh, is after the nation of Israel was split into two kingdoms. Judah in the south, Israel in, in the north. Judah, it was the splitting of these 12 tribes of Israel. And they, they politically, uh, they split and became two nations. And Ahaz is a young king of the southern nation of Judah. And he finds himself in trouble. The story goes like this, Isaiah 7, starting in verse 1. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, and grandson of Uzziah, when Ahaz was king of Judah, king Rezin of Syria, you you might know them from Old Testament as Aram, but they're listed as Syria here, Syria, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, set out to attack Jerusalem. So the picture is, These two nations, Israel in the north and Syria, just to the, what would be the west, to the east maybe, 
Syria and Israel are going to attack Judah. And this young king, Ahaz, how does he respond to this? However, they were unable to carry out their plan. Verse 2, the news had come to the royal court of Judah. And this is the news. This is the report Ahaz got. Syria is allied with Israel against us. So the hearts of the king, that's Ahaz, and his people trembled with fear like trees shake in a storm. We have a tree in front of our house that I think has set the world record for producing the number of leaves that fall. Yeah, I think, I think we're at about a billion and a half leaves from this one tree in front of our house. And it's, so Ahaz and his people hear this news like, because Israel is a stronger nation militarily, and now they have an ally, and they're coming against Judah, and they're afraid. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Isaiah is a prophet. He's a faithful prophet to the Lord. He hears what the Lord is saying, and the Lord uses him to communicate. Then the Lord said to the prophet Isaiah, take your son, Shira Jashub, that's a mouthful, Shira Jashub, and go out to meet King Ahaz. You will find him at the end of the aqueduct that feeds water into the upper pool near the road leading to the field where the cloth is washed. This is early form of GPS. At the next leg, take a right and proceed to where the clothes is washed. Tell him, tell Ahaz, to stop worrying. Now I'm going to ask you a question before we go on. Why do you think Ahaz has gotten God's attention to have this comforting word given to him? Apparently, Ahaz is on, not on the naughty list, right? But so God is giving this king, this young king, a very special and encouraging word. Tell him not to worry. Tell him he doesn't need to fear the fierce anger of those two burned-out embers. That's Old Testament prophetic smack. Those two burned-out embers, King Rezin of Syria and Pekah son of Remaliah. Yes, the kings of Syria and Israel are plotting against him, saying, we'll attack Judah and capture it for ourselves. Then we will install Tabeel as Judah's king. Well, they've already got the reformation plan in place. They've chosen the guy that's going to replace Ahaz. And God says, Isaiah, take your young son along, and I want you to tell King Ahaz, don't worry. Don't worry. Verse 7 but this is what the sovereign Lord says. This is a continuation of the message that God has Isaiah giving to Ahaz. This is what the sovereign Lord says. This invasion will never happen. It will never take place. For Syria is no stronger than its capital, Damascus, and Damascus no stronger than its king, Rezin. As for Israel... Your, your relative to the north, within 65 years, it will be crushed and completely destroyed. And this prophecy was fulfilled. The Israelites were carried away in exile 65 years later. Verse 9, Israel is no stronger than its capital, Samaria, and Samaria is no stronger than its king, Pekah, son of Remaliah. Unless, get this now, this is really important, unless your faith is firm, I cannot make you stand firm. Oh. Now, 
the encouraging word from the Lord through the prophet Isaiah to this young king is, don't worry. Don't get caught up in fear. This isn't going to happen. And then he gives him his part. And that part is this. Unless your faith is firm, I can't make you stand firm. So, apparently that was the end of that interaction between Isaiah and Ahaz. And what do you think Ahaz decided to do? Did he take God up on this offer to not worry and not be afraid? It says in verse 10, Later, the Lord sent this message to King Ahaz. So another contact. Ask the Lord, and this is Isaiah bringing this message to Ahaz, ask the Lord your God for a sign of confirmation, Ahaz. Make it as difficult as you want, as high as the heaven or as deep as the place of the dead. Wouldn't you like to have that? Like, you wouldn't want to use it up on some minor problem, but man, wouldn't you want to have that one? Okay, go ahead, ask for a sign, make it real hard. Make it real hard, because I'm going to show you I'm good to my word. Ask for a sign. And here is how the young king Ahaz responds. But the king refused. No, he said, I will not test the Lord like that. At first reading, that sounds like right answer. Good job. That's a smart guy because it says in the Scripture, do not put the Lord your God to the test. But what happens if the Lord's saying in a specific situation, put me to the test? Say the secret word, right? Put me to the test. And if you say no, oh, now, because you got to read understand what's going on here. God's making an offer, and he's, and this is Isaiah's McNade translation, talk to the hand. Nope, I'm not going to do it. What, what's not said here, but what we understand through other scriptures and the historical account is this. Oh, Ahaz was still worrying about those burned out embers, those kings that were set against him. And he was in the process of making an alliance with Tiglath-Pileser III, the king of Assyria. And Assyria was the big boy on the block. He was in the process of making his own alliance. Like, oh, okay. He even went so far as to take the gold from the treasury and the dedicated, some of the dedicated things that the Lord had in the temple and gave them as an offering and tribute to the king of Assyria to seal this alliance. So when he was saying, no, I, I'm not going to put the Lord to the test like that, he was putting the Lord to the test by saying, I will form an alliance that's better than the one you're offering me. Does anybody have the sense you just want to say, ooh, oh, bad decision. But that's, what, that's what's going on behind the, in between here. He's making another alliance. And so Isaiah who is nobody's fool, he's reading between the lines. He says this. Then Isaiah, verse 13, Then Isaiah said, Listen, you family of David. That doesn't have a good tone to it already. Listen, you fam royal family of David. Isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? In other words, he's saying, I'm fed up with you. Must you exhaust the patience of my God as well? All right then, 
the Lord himself will give you a sign. And remember, he said, hey, choose anything. Choose something real difficult. Make it as high or as deep as you want it. This is what Isaiah says. All right, then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give a birth. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. By the time this child is old enough to choose what is right and reject what is wrong, he will be eating yogurt and honey. For before the child is that old, the lands of the two kings you fear so much will both be deserted. Some were saying, well, was this Isaiah? Who, who was this child? This child that's going to be born of a virgin. Well, it won't be Isaiah's wife because he already has a son with the real long name, Shirab Jashub. Some scholars think that this was actually the young king Ahaz, one of his wives, who was, had not yet conceived, would conceive a child and that child would be named Emmanuel. And you might be thinking, but isn't that what I've heard associated with Jesus? And this is part of, this is an interesting aspect of prophecy. It oftentimes has multiple application. Application in the temporal and in the eternal. Or that it can be applied and fulfilled more than once. And in fact, this scripture is attributed to Jesus in the scriptures prophetically that this is a messianic prophecy about the one, going back to what we talked about earlier, who would crush the head of the serpent but would be struck by that serpent. The one that the creation is waiting for. This prophecy that Isaiah gave to this young king Ahaz is going to be fulfilled in a much broader sense, in a sense that brings the final remedy. It will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who will be born of a virgin. I asked you earlier, who deserves God's grace? Who deserves his mercy? Who deserves his presence? That, that who deserves his God with me, God with us presence? And who doesn't deserve it? Remember I said, I, I, I at least am, as I read through this, coming to the conclusion, I really don't often think like God because Isaiah goes to somebody who doesn't seem to be worthy of his this kind of attention this kind of care this kind of support and encouragement let me read you something about Isaiah that's found in the scriptures in the book of 2 Kings. This gives you a snapshot of who, I said Isaiah, of Ahaz, of the young king Ahaz. This is a snapshot of Ahaz from 2 Kings chapter 16, starting in the verse first, first verse. Ahaz, son of Jotham, began to rule over Judah in the 17th year of King Pekah's reign in Israel. Okay, we already know some of that. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, very young. And he reigned in Israel 16 years. He did not do what was pleasing in the sight of the Lord his God as his ancestor David had done. Stop there for a moment. So he would be on the naughty list. He would be somebody that would not deserve any kind of attention or care or comfort from God, right? Well, let's, maybe I'm reading into that. Let's see if there's more. Verse 3, instead of doing what was pleasing inside of the Lord, instead, 
he followed the example of the kings of Israel, even sacrificing his own son in the fire. <clears throat> in this way, he followed the detestable practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. Did you get that? The, one of the practices and one of the false gods that was worshipped by the group that was you know, collectively known as the Canaanites. One of those gods was, one of the names was Molech. And the way in which this god was worshipped, sought after for appeasement and blessing was through child sacrifice. They've found uh, archaeologically these uh, idols of, of a God that had the hands and arms extended out and it would be put over fire. It was metal. It would be put over fire and heated up. And as best as, as they're able to tell, in the pagan worship of this false God, people were so deluded that they would put their children to death by fire and flame in the, wor in the hopes of finding favor in the eyes of a God that wasn't even a God. And Ahaz, when he came into power, even though he had great example, a, 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 a humble example in King David, he chose someone other than God. So now, when you consider, why would he reject the offer of God for an alliance and choose the Assyrian king? That was the path that he had already been walking in. Now I ask you, somebody who would do that, are they going to be on the list of people that we make that, okay, we're going to decide who gets God's care and comfort and attention and grace and mercy? Everybody, Ahaz? No hands. No surprise. So why, why did God send Isaiah to Ahaz with that word of comfort? Don't worry. Don't be afraid. I have you covered. The things that you're hearing and the plots that are against you will never come to pass. I offer to you an alliance, a remedy. And he says, no. We can look at that and think, he's the only one that ever did it, except for me on many occasions. It's still happening, isn't it? There are still people rejecting God's offer of remedy and alliance, comfort and and care, his presence for something lesser. And yet, regardless of what anyone else thinks, God is the one who decides who is worthy of his presence, his comfort, and his care. I was emailing or texting back and forth with my brother Scott and Lindsay. They were remembering when our family lived outside of Denver, Colorado. I was only four. I don't have any memories from before, like, last week. So they were remembering things that I couldn't remember. The address of the place we lived. The only memory that I have of living in the outskirts of Denver, Colorado, as a four-year-old, is some, I was going to use the word punk, but I will, punk, 
in our neighborhood who had a chunk of concrete and he hucked it at me and he hit me in the back and on the neck. And all I can remember is it hurt and I cried. And my mom was ticked and I thought, you can take me but you're toast if she gets a hold of you. And I was, so we were recounting and I said, that's the only memory I have. And I said something about this kid that threw this hunk of concrete at me and then I kind of got rolling. Like, like, yeah, and he deserves, I, now I didn't cuss, but I, I thought punishment. That's what I was thinking. And my brother Lindsay texts back, but not that you're bitter or anything. Because it's only been 57 years or 58. But, I mean, Sean, just, you know, work your way through that bitterness. You know who's on the naughty list? That kid that hit me with the concrete. But that's my list. That's not God's list. God's intent on bringing remedy to all. Now the scripture makes it clear not all will receive it. There are going to be some like Ahaz who say, I've got a better alliance and I have a better offer. I'm going that direction. Now it won't, that's not a wise choice. But God made us to be free moral agents. In other words, he gave us the incredible gift of choice. Each of us has it. Ahaz, in my opinion, did not choose wisely. But I I could be related to Ahaz because there's been times when I've made some really poor choices when it came to alliances that I've made. So I want to wrap this up by saying this. Are there people that you're keeping in a cage because you don't think they're worth grace or mercy, God's comfort or care, His remedy? Because if there is, I want to remind you that our Master Jesus, one of the names by which he's called is Emmanuel. We're going to unpack that in the, in the weeks that are coming here. We're going to unpack what comes with that name, Emmanuel. But if, if you have someone that you have relegated to not being eligible for the God, for for the Lord's kindness and care and comfort, I want to encourage you to rethink that. Is it possible that you and God might be thinking differently on this? As my brother said, not that you're bitter or anything, but I, I say that because this is not my greatest strength. I've kept people at different times in my life in cages. Shut off from the grace and mercy of God as if it was my choice. And you know what happens? (laughs) I find out over and over again, I'm the one behind bars. I'm the one who's being having a hard time accepting grace and mercy. And I'm shutting myself off instead of shutting somebody else off. And then lastly, I I would just like to ask you this. Have you put yourself behind bars and deemed yourself unworthy of the Lord's comfort and care? His presence, God with you, If you have, 
I just say to you, our God is the God of remedy. We're going to see that He's gone so far that He's willing to take a fatal blow to be struck in order for us to be released from our self-imposed prisons. Not just the ones we might keep others in, but the ones that we might relegate ourselves to. He truly is Emmanuel, God, with you. So don't be afraid. Don't worry. The things and plans that people have set against you, they will not come to pass. Because with God, you and God, you're a majority. And you're going to find out the things that you think are set against you are just like old, burned out embers. Let's pray. I, I am just so thankful, Lord, even in a humorous way from my brother saying, not that you're bitter, Sean. I, Lord, that just prompts me to say, I, I don't want to be a bitter man. I don't want to keep people in a cage or a prison separated from your presence and your grace and mercy. And Lord, I, I don't want to be in that prison either. I ask for myself and my friends here, those that are watching this, that you would help us, help us this day to make our alliance of faith with you. And we thank you for loving us and bringing us the remedy for that which is toxic. So here we are, God. Come and inhabit us. Have us. We will follow you. Amen. Lord bless you as you worship here. Feel free to stand if you have to it as we close with singing these words again. Don't let this go to your head, but um, you could, you, you, if you're following Jesus and you've surrendered your life and faith to him, he's in you. Not like Gatorade, not like that commercial. 
but he's in you. And you can take the Lord and his remedy to people who are in a cage. You might bring a word of comfort and encouragement to somebody in the next few weeks that you run across. You might even think, I, th- I think you don't think you're deserving of God's grace and mercy. But he's in you. And he'll use you to bring that message of hope to someone else. Let's just be people who don't keep people in cages, but we help them get out in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now may the Lord bless you. And may he keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give to you his perfect peace. Be blessed. Take time this week to take in a small portion of the word day by day and stay the course in your faith in the Lord. You're dismissed. God bless you, friends.